May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One way that I meditate on scripture to prepare for a sermon is to sit quietly with the characters and listen to what they want to teach me. Sitting with the Samaritan woman at the well has been profoundly beautiful as I've pondered the theological implications of this story, as well as the ways her story was resonating with me personally. She teaches me the importance of dialoguing with Jesus as a pathway to increase my faith in God and to be a better witness of God's love in the world. She draws my attention to the human potential for making assumptions about someone else's story and the ways I can make judgments based on what I see rather than taking the time to sit quietly and listen. And she has motivated me to take an inward look at some of the prescribed roles, societal norms, and gender-based binaries that have been placed upon me that still leaves me thirsting for that liberating, life-giving water that Jesus has to offer. Yesterday, during my morning meditation time, I closed my eyes, invoked the Holy Spirit, and asked Jesus to show me the way to salvation. Kind of a big ask, I know. But that's where my spirit wanted to go in the moment. Through surrendering to that moment, I saw in my mind's eye the most extraordinary vision. I was on a bit of land, nowhere in particular, but it was green and lush and healthy looking. Below me was a river, flowing gently before me the way rivers do. With the ear of my heart, I could hear a familiar burbling sound as the water rushed over the stones at the bottom. I felt such a sense of peace and serenity in the place the Spirit brought me to in that moment. There was nothing else around me but the ground I was standing on, the rushing river, and the Spirit of God. Momentary bliss, momentary oneness with Spirit, momentary separation from every wound, every trauma, every sadness. I was one with something else that I recognized as nearness to God. Seizing the moment, I asked God to show me the way. There was nothing more to my question, but I could feel within myself an openness and a willingness to surrender to God, to anything God wanted to show me. And without hesitation or conscious thought, I lifted out my arms as if I were ready to take flight. And I, I let myself fall forward into the river, mind, body, and spirit. Floating down the river, trusting that somehow the river was God, and that that is where I was supposed to be, letting go of myself, and simply being in the flow of God. And I was free. This, I think, is what the liberating, life-giving, thirst-quenching, living water of God must be. The Samaritan woman and I were suddenly one. In that moment, suspended in time, eternal life, maybe? She and I were set free. Poet and author Jan Richardson wrote a blessing of the well, which resonated with my meditative experience. I made copies and put them on the back table if you'd like to take one. I have absolutely loved engaging in an exegetical study of this story this past week. And I think it's worth sharing a few theological findings that commentators point out, which might encourage you to dig a little deeper into this piece of scripture. 
That is, after all, the invitation at the end of this story, an invitation to come and see for yourself so that you, too, can dialogue with Jesus and be his disciple. Here are a few things I learned that feel important to share. To set the stage for this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, it's helpful to see how it contrasts with the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus that we heard last week. Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman are unique to the Gospel of John and are lifted up as models for discipleship, but they couldn't be more different. Let's break that down a bit. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. He's a man, he has a name, and he comes to Jesus by night. The Samaritan is a religious, social, and political outsider. She's a woman. She is not named in the story. And she meets Jesus at noontime, in full daylight. Nicodemus seemed unable to move beyond the confines of his religious system, while the Samaritan woman decidedly moves outside of her religious expectations to engage with Jesus in a theological debate. Nicodemus could not hear that Jesus was sent by God, while the woman at the well hears the actual name of God, I am. And they both leave their encounter with Jesus with a question. Nicodemus asks, how can this be? As he leaves in disbelief, while the Samaritan woman asks, he cannot be the Christ, can he? Which leads her to witness to her whole village. She invites them to see for themselves what salvation through Christ Jesus can mean for them in their own lives. Now, the setting for this scene is carefully laid out by the Gospel writer. But in order to understand why the setting is so critical to the theological teachings of John's Gospel, we need to include the verses that have been left out of the lectionary, verses 1 through 4, which lead Jesus arriving in Sychar. They read like this. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. He left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. These verses are important to highlight because they offer some clues as to why this encounter with the Samaritan woman are important to both Jesus and the woman. First, we are told that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, which naturally irritates the Pharisees. Now remember, last week's attempt at making a disciple failed in Nicodemus. Although if you were here last week, you would have heard Reverend Edwin Johnson's uh, offering Nicodemus a second chance in his sermon, Nicodemus 2.0. I commend to you Edwin's sermon, which was recorded for your listening pleasure. Back to Jesus. So Jesus is on his way back to Galilee from Judea, and the scripture states, states, but he had to go through Samaria. Commentators agree that Jesus probably didn't actually have to go through Samaria. In fact, Jews in the time of Jesus would have intentionally avoided Samaria due to the rift between the Jews and the Samaritans. During that time, Jews traveling from Jerusalem to Galilee would have crossed over the Jordan River and traveled up the other side, crossing the Jordan a second time and into Galilee. Jesus intentionally traveling through Samaria is an important detail that highlights what we already know about Jesus' ministry. He fishes for people and makes disciples by crossing borders and boundaries and seeking out those who cannot even imagine themselves as objects of God's love. He finds them, wherever they are. Jesus makes his way to Jacob's well. This historical and holy site is important for a couple of reasons. 
Jesus' ministry is to bring others into the fold. Unity within diversity is the way I like to think about it. There were several things that divided Jews from Samaritans, but something that Jesus understood was that both the Samaritans and Jews traced their lineage back to Abraham and his descendants. Jesus and the Samaritan woman could both trace their ancestry back to God through the call of Abraham. This becomes important in the dialogue between the two to blur the lines of division when she begins to question why Jesus would be talking to her in the first place. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans, she says. And Jesus responds by introducing what the gift of God can mean in the circumstance of division. What it can mean is salvation, a sense of belonging to God and to one another, which can lead to liberating love. Isn't that something we all yearn for in our own lives? Liberating love. Another detail to note in the setting of Jacob's well is this. In addition to being a source of water, wells serve as an important function in Hebrew scripture as betrothal scenes. Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis chapter 24, Jacob and Leah in Genesis chapter 29, and Moses and Zipporah in the book of Exodus chapter 2, who all met and became engaged to be married at a well. Now, I'm not suggesting, and neither is anyone else, that Jesus went to the well for that reason. But the well does represent an intimate place, a place of relationship, promise, and hope. And all these things are an important part of a relationship with God through Jesus. But just like any relationship, it requires trust. Jesus, who was at the well at noon, tired and worn out from his journey, needs water. He establishes that he is vulnerable and in need, and that she can be the source of his need, which disarms her through the invitation into a relationship of mutuality. Jesus engages her first by his request for water. He needs water from her. And she needs the kind of relationship Jesus is inviting her into, one of reciprocity and mutuality. A kind of relationship that this woman may have never had with anyone else among the societal barriers and boundaries that have kept her in her place. One commentator says, he is dependent on her, modeling the mutual dependence on which relationship and discipleship is based. This interdependence is accentuated by his request. He asks for what he will provide for her. Although the initial invitation to the first disciples was to follow, the discipleship that Jesus has in mind will be one of companionship, friendship, and taking on the ministry at his death. This kind of relationship and model of discipleship that Jesus is offering is important to the conversation that Jesus has regarding the woman's five husbands. Oftentimes, the conversation about the woman's many husbands and her current relationship with a man who was noted by Jesus not to be her husband is interpreted as a judgment on her moral character, her sin, if you will, for which she needs forgiveness. But the text never actually says anything about sins she's committed, nor does Jesus ever forgive her in the scripture passage. Jesus is not critical or judgmental or condemning. Rather, he simply knows her truth, and he wants her to recognize him as truth, and the truth of who she could be in him. Commentator Caroline Lewis states that, moreover, sin in the Gospel of John is not a moral cate category related to behavior. Sin is unbelief, the inability or unwillingness to acknowledge Jesus as Lord 
and God. Through theological discourse, the woman at the well was able to move beyond the literalism of the conversation with Jesus to a new level of understanding who Jesus is and the potential for who she could be in him. Abide in me as I abide in you, says Jesus. This is the invitation for us all, I think, and the catalyst for this woman's witness to her whole village. He told me everything I have ever done, she says. He knows her truth. Not only does he know about her, but he knows what it means to be her. This is the intimacy that a relationship with Jesus offers each of us, to be known, to be fully known by God through Jesus. This is the liberating love that we experience when we can surrender to God's love for us. By leaving her bucket behind, the Samaritan woman leaves behind her marginalization and her loneliness. Because Jesus has now brought her into the fold of God's truth and abiding love. She is reborn into a new and abundant life of ever-flowing living water a river of love like the one I dropped into during my meditation, where she is set free to become who she is in God. What better witness could there be to invite others to come and see than one who has fallen into the flow of the living water of Jesus? Amen.